Yo, what's up guys, so today we are gonna see, what if, Naruto got harem with female Haku, Tenten, Fu and Samui, part 1, hope you'll enjoy this video, so before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, Shadozerson, link is in the description, and also subscribe to my channel, and like this video. It was a peaceful morning in Kanahagakur no Sato, as many of the civilians were going about their daily lives. The lone exception was a little blonde boy running throughout the streets, hoping to shake his pursers. The boy hid between gaps of buildings while sticking in the shadows to conceal his bright orange jumpsuit. The blonde paused to catch his breath as he wiped the sweat off of his whiskered face. Green goggles were fastened on his forehead as his bright blue eyes scanned the surroundings, eyeing his safe haven. Finding the coast to be clear, the boy dashed towards the red light district of Kanoha. He smiled, sure of his victory, when he was suddenly hoisted into the air by his jacket collar. Naruto. An irritated male voice said as he looked at the boy. Nine-year-old Uzumaki Naruto turned to see his diabolical academy instructor, Jai. Naruto blanched. How do you always find me, Ruka-sensei? The boy asked, trying to struggle out of his captor's grasp. Yumino Ruka was an average high chunin who served as an academy instructor. He wore blue shinobi overalls underneath his green flak jacket. Ruka's most prominent features were his brown hair that was typically tied in a ponytail, and a scar on the bridge of his nose. We're going to the Hokage, where you'll explain yourself, Ruka said. He placed a young boy on his shoulder, and walked towards the Hokage building, ignoring the various stairs from the villagers of Kanoha. Upon arrival, Iruka greeted the Sandame Hokage, Sirotobi Hirzen. Hirzen was an elderly man who served as Kanahagakur's leader. Despite his elderly appearance, many shinobis feared him for his vast arrays of. This eventually earned him the moniker, the professor. As the strongest person in the village, his word was typically the law, but a few were beginning to undermine his rule. Hiruzen had initially retired from his position, but was forced back into duty after the death of his successor. Ah thank you Ruka. I was hoping that you would be able to find Naruto-kun. The Sandame said, as he lit his pipe of tobacco. The scar Chunin bowed in recognition before dropping Naruto unceremoniously on the ground. Be a little gentle, Iruka-sensei. The boy complained, as he rubbed his sore behind. Before Iruka could retort to his student, Sandame intervened. Naruto I have several reports from people claiming that they've seen you painting graffiti all over the Chiha compound. Hiruzen stated. Is this true? The old man asked for confirmation. Sometimes the villagers would blame Naruto for things the young boy didn't commit, in order to get Naruto in trouble. Of course that was me. No one else is able to pull off a prank that awesome. I actually think this is my best prank yet, old man. Naruto replied, as he gave a foxy grin. He had pranked the Ichihas because they often sided with villagers when the villagers pressed charges against Naruto. Of course the charges were usually falsely accused, but the military police didn't believe him. Show Hokage some some respect for Naruto. Iruka scolded, as he wished his student would mind his manners. The Hokage could only chuckle, as the two began bickering with each other. If only the rest of the villagers would treat Naruto like Iruka does. Hiruzen remarked sadly. He knew that the boy was hated for what he carried. The Sandame had tried a variety of ways to make Naruto's life easier. From making laws to giving the boy a monthly stipend was just some of the ways that he tried. Still the villagers would try to sabotage the boy every chance they got. Well since you take credit for the act, as punishment, you're to clean the entire compound. Naruto's face instantly soured from the words. What? He shouted loudly. What do you mean I have to clean it? The blonde asked in protest. Hiruzen calmly took a drag from his pipe and blew the smoke into the air. Think of this as a lesson. Shinobi are required to have a variety of skills to succeed in a mission. One of those skills is stealth. Learning to complete your objective without being spotted could be a matter of life and death. Sandame advised the academy students. Naruto rubbed his chin, as he processed the words he just heard. So, as long as I don't get caught in the act, I don't have to worry about receiving punishments. The boy summarized while flashing a wide grin. Both Hiruzen and Iruka shuddered at the innocent smile. But before they could say anything, Naruto continued. Thanks for the advice, old man. I'm going to head off and start on my punishment. I'm going to make sure that this is my last punishment. With that, he finished and left the room. The two adults silently stared at the door where the blonde left through. Iruka please tell me I didn't make the situation worse. Hiruzen hoped while rubbing his temples with his thumbs. A headache was quickly forming because of Naruto. Don't worry Hokage-sama, there's absolutely no way that we won't be able to catch Naruto if he pulls another prank. Iruka tried to reassure the Hokage. That being said, besides me, no one else has been able to catch him recently. I hope I'm thinking too much into this. The brunette Chunin mused. Later that evening, Naruto finally finished scrubbing out all of the paint from his prank. He had forgotten how huge the place actually was. The Chiha compound was located northeast of Kanahagakur, isolated from most of the village. The compound spanned several acres, making it easily the biggest clan compound. Collapsing on the ground near the front entrance, Naruto remembered the Chihas he saw during his cleanup. 
Almost all of them were subtly glaring at him or whispering things like demon boy behind his back. He did manage to see Sasuke, who was practicing on a dummy. Naruto usually didn't associate with the other boy, as they were stark opposites. Sasuke was the upcoming prodigy, while Naruto was known as the dead last. The blonde was overly friendly, while the Chiha kept more to himself. This resulted in the two arguing whenever they saw each other. This time was no different, as Sasuke said that Naruto was trespassing. They argued until the blonde eventually left to finish cleaning up. Naruto steadied his breath, as he laid on the ground. Hearing footsteps coming towards him, Naruto turned to see a woman carrying a plate, and a glass of water. The long blue-haired woman was wearing a dark blue kimono held together by a white sash. On the back of the kimono was the Ichiha symbol, a fan that was red on top, and white on the bottom. Good job on cleaning up your prank. The woman smiled, as she bent down on the ground. She placed a glass, and played in front of Naruto. The boy sat up, and looked at her oddly. Who are you? Naruto pointed to her. And what's this? He then pointed to the plate that was holding several sandwiches. Oh forgive me. The woman replied. I'm Ichiha Mikoto, and you are. Uzumaki Naruto, nice to meet you, he replied back while smiling. The lady in front of him seemed friendly. She hadn't cursed or glared at him even after he told her his name. Hamdadabeo, why does that sound familiar? Mikoto mused, as an image of a red-haired female popped into her head. Looking closely at Naruto's features, she began to see his resemblance to Kashina. Could he possibly be Kashina's son, but I thought the baby died along with Kashina. Mikoto continued to stare at Naruto, unnerving the blonde. Okami, if you take away those whiskers, then you have a carbon copy of a younger Minato. I need to talk to Hokage-sama about this. Is there something on my face? Naruto wondered, as he began to feel around his face. This snapped the blue-haired woman from her trance. Oh, it's nothing. Mikoto replied quickly. Here, I have something to eat. I'm pretty sure you're feeling hungry. She said to change the subject. Naruto eyed the sandwiches suspiciously, wondering if it was tampered with. It was odd that someone was willing to give him free food. The only person that ever did that was Sandane. Seeing the food caused his stomach to rumble. With his stomach winning out, he graciously accepted the sandwiches and began devouring them. Why are you being so nice to me? Naruto asked with a mouthful of food. Mikoto was disturbed by the sight. She briefly wondered if he was ever taught manners. Uzumaki-san, please finish sheeting before talking. The Chiha matriarch released a small killing intent to get her point across. The blonde was startled by the killing intent, and quickly nodded his head. After a minute, the plate and glass were empty. Why are you being so nice to me? The boy once again asked. You can call me Naruto by the way. I'm not good with honorifics and stuff. Well can I call you Naruto Kanden? Mikoto's question was answered with a nod from Naruto. Well the reason why I'm being nice to you is because I saw you working hard cleaning up. So I thought you deserved a reward. Naruto tilted his head in confusion. Why should I get a reward? He asked before clarifying. This was my punishment for pranking your place. That may be, but nonetheless, you deserve something for working hard. Mikoto smiled at him. He blushed from the praise. Thank you Mikoto-san. Naruto said shyly, as he scratched the back of his head. She frowned mentally, wondering if the boy was ever praised before. Standing back to full height, Mikoto helped Naruto off the ground. Now I must ask, Naruto-kun, why did you prank the Ichiha compound? The blue-haired woman inquired. Naruto pondered for a second before giving his answer. Well someone had to teach the Ichiha pricks a lesson. The boy answered. Realizing his mistake, Naruto hastily spoke one more time. I don't mean you're a prick Mikoto-san. I'm talking about the other Ichihas. He said nervously, hoping he didn't offend her. Mikoto chuckled at how the little boy was acting. Can you promise me not to prank this place again? Mikoto asked politely. Naruto shook his head, much to her dislike. I can't promise that. The blonde replied. Okay, how about a deal then? She proposed, getting his attention. If you promise not to prank the Ichiha compound then I will teach you how to be a shinobi. How do you know I attend the academy? He asked. Mikoto smiled, as she answered his question. My sons, Sasuke-kun and Itachi-kun, talk about you. It was more of Sasuke complaining how the blonde boy kept on interrupting class with his pranks. Naruto received the shock of his short life. You're the mom of Sasuke team. He shouted in disbelief. How can the mom be so nice, but the son be such a jerk? Naruto muttered, trying to wrap it around his head that Mikoto was Sasuke's mom. Wait a minute. Who in the heck is Itachi? As on cue, an Anmu wearing all black, and a weasel mask appeared before the two. Itachi kun weasel nai. The two said from the appearance of the Anbu. Naruto ran up to the Anbu, and gave him a hug. Every time someone tried to harass Naruto, an Anbu would typically be there to intervene. Usually it was weasel, dog, or cat that came to his rescue. Weasel would even piggyback Naruto back to his apartment. The blonde loved to fly across the rooftops on Weasel's back, as he felt safe from all dangers. Hello Kasan, Naruto-kun. Itachi replied to the two, slightly surprised to find Naruto in front of the compound. Wait. Naruto said in realization. So your name is Itachi, not Weasel. 
The blonde asked, as he released the hug. It would be weird if his name was actually a weasel. Itachi nodded to the question. Yes, my name is Itachi. The Chiha heir said, as he removed his mask. Naruto-kun, can you promise me not to tell anyone my real name? Sure thing Itachi Nai. Your secret is safe with me. The boy replied confidently. Mikoto smiled watching the two boys interact. Mikoto-san, is it too late to accept your deal? Of course not Naruto-kun. I take it that you accept then? She asked to which she nodded. Well, how about I meet you at training ground 11 after school? Where's that? Naruto inquired. Itachi decided to answer the question. Directly south of the Shinobi Academy, there are multiple training grounds. There is usually a sign that indicates what number the training ground is. Simply find the number 11, and you'll be at the right training ground. The Chiha male explained. They nodded to them, and were about to head off when Nakoto stopped him. Wait a minute, Naruto-kun. She said before heading to her home. A minute later, she came out with a book. Here, Naruto-kun. Mikoto handed him a book titled Shinobi Basics 101. I want you to try to read all of this before we see each other tomorrow. I hate books. The blonde muttered. I don't want to read it. Naruto said, as he politely handed the book back. Mikoto denied it, and shook her head. Naruto-kun if you want to be a great shinobi, you need to read books. Itachi agreed with his mother. Naruto-kun books have knowledge in them. The more knowledge one possesses, the stronger the ninja becomes. The male Ichiha reasoned. Naruto sighed, knowing it would be futile to resist. He reluctantly accepted the book. Okay, I'll try to finish it by tomorrow. Naruto frowned slightly before turning to the two Chihas. By Itachi Nai and Mikoto-san. He said his farewells before leaving the compound and towards Ichirakus. Ka-san. Itachi said to get her attention. May I ask why you wish to train Naruto-kun? There's a chance that he's the son of my best friend and she'll never forgive me for not being in his life. Obviously she couldn't tell Itachi that. I always wanted to help my sons train, but your father wouldn't permit it. So I thought it would be nice to train Naruto-kun. Itachi stared at her impassively, and nodded. That is fine, mother, but I believe you should talk with Hokage-sama about this. He said, and began walking towards their house. Well I'll do just that. Tell your father, and Sasuke-kun I will be back shortly. Mikoto then used Shunshin no Jutsu, buddy flicker technique, to appear outside the Hokage tower. Luckily it was late in the day so having an audience with the Hokage was easy. After being led in by the secretary, she appears in the room where Sandane was doing paperwork. Oh Mikoto-chan, what can I do for you today? Hiruzen smiled, as he glanced up from his work, and gestured to Mikoto to sit. The Chiha matriarch sat down, as the elderly man gave her his attention. Hello Hokage-sama, I wish to talk about matters regarding a certain blonde-headed boy, and his heritage. With a wave, Hiruzen dismissed all the anbu in the room, and activated the privacy seals. What do you wish to talk about that pertains to Naruto? The image of a friendly grandfather was replaced with that of the shinobi no kami, god of shinobi. I wish to know why I wasn't informed that Kashina's son was alive. The Chiha woman went straight to the matter at hand. Hiruzen took a puff from his tobacco pipe. Why do you believe that Naruto is the son of Kashina? Mikoto let out a sigh, and began explaining. Hokage-sama. I can't believe no one including myself hadn't seen it sooner. If you take away Naruto's whiskers, you'll have a carbon copy of Minato when he was younger. Mikoto said, as she was still in disbelief. Hiruzen nodded, believing the same. The nod was all Mikoto needed to confirm her suspicions. When people are blinded by hate, they fail to see the most obvious of things. He remarked sadly, and wondered if the village will ever regain the will of fire. Meanwhile, Mikoto was feeling angry not only at the villagers, but angry at herself for not noticing it sooner. Does he know about his heritage? She asked even though she suspected that Naruto didn't know. Just like with the Kayubi, his heritage is an S-class secret. This is to prevent the likes of Aiwa and Kumo coming here to either kill or kidnap him. The Hokage explained. She agreed because that would most likely happen if Aiwa and Kumo would ever come to know of Naruto's existence. Hokage-sama, please allow me to adopt him. It is the least I could do for Kashina's boy after not being in his life for 9 years. Mikoto knew she would feel Kashina's wrath if she ever saw the red hat again. I'm afraid I cannot allow that. He answered. Why, Hokage-sama? Mikoto was confused. Why was he refusing her? If I were to let one of the clans adopt Naruto, then that clan would have more power over the others, due to the fact that Naruto is a believe me when I say that you weren't the first to approach me to adopt him after finding out his heritage. Here is an answer. -er. Who else knows besides us? Mikoto was shocked that others knew of this secret as well. Hiruzen took another puff from his pipe. He really was too old for this job. Including us, it would be Jiraiya, Shikaku, and Shibi. Jiraiya is Naruto's godfather, but unfortunately he has a spy network to run so he can't be here. Shikaku found out when he went to pick up his son from the park. He saw Naruto, and immediately connected him to Minato. Shibi said that he detected that Naruto's chakra was similar to his parents. The latter two also asked to adopt him. I see. The mood was depressed, as Mikoto uttered those words. Would it be alright if I taught, and trained him to be a shinobi? 
she asked, hopeful of the Hokage's answer. The mood was no longer gloomy, as Hiruzen chuckled. I see absolutely no problem with that. Thank you Hokage-sama. Mikoto's face instantly brightened, as she bowed deeply. So the Koorimi no Megami, goddess of body replacement, is going to teach someone again. Hiruzen teased the younger woman. Mikoto sighed at that nickname. I really loathe that moniker. Couldn't they come up with something else? She frowned before addressing the rest of the statement. I didn't even teach Shisui much, it was mostly due to his own hard work. According to him, you helped in making the Shunshin no Shisui, Shisui of the body flicker, into a deadly force he was known as. It's a pity that he committed suicide two years ago. Hiruzen remarked sadly. Shisui had committed suicide in hopes of quelling the flames of rebellion. It had worked, as the Ichiha had temporarily halted their plans. It wasn't until recently that plans had begun anew. Nakoto nodded, as she still remembered the compassionate Ichiha that was Itachi's best friend. Well I must leave to prepare dinner, please excuse me, and have a good day Hokage-sama. She said, as Hiruzen dismissed her. Mikoto exited the building with a swirl of leaves. The Sandame sighed, as he leaned back in his chair. It's a pity that there aren't more Ichiha like you Mikoto. I can only hope that your clan doesn't do something hasty, and actually try a coup at it. Hopefully I can patch things up soon. He turned back to his paperwork, as the pile seemingly got bigger since he last saw it. I really need to look for a successor. On the way towards his two-story apartment building, Naruto let out a heavy sigh. Graffiti of all colors decorated the wall leading towards his door. Words such as demon and die were commonly repeated among the writings. Naruto unlocked the door to his apartment room. He locked the door quickly after stepping into the apartment that the Hokage had brought for him when he was four. At just four years old, he was kicked out from the orphanage and left to wander the streets for food and shelter. His food was overdue food products that were in the trash, while his shelter was either in the forest or somewhere in the playgrounds. His luck turned for the better when the old man found him near the Saratobi estate. The Hokage quickly took him inside for some food and clothing. That day was the happiest day in young Naruto's life. Not only did he get to eat good food and had a roof over his head, the old man looked at him differently from the rest of the villagers. Where the villagers would glare at him with hate and scorn, the Hokage looked at Naruto with sorrow and guilt. The boy didn't understand why, but he was just glad that it was different. Sandame proceeded to rent him a room at an apartment complex on the edge of the red light district. As soon as he moved in, all the other occupants moved out. Even the landlord moved away, leaving him all alone in the two-story building. Even though Naruto didn't need to pay rent, he always wondered why people avoided him or downright hated him. For, as long as he could remember, the villagers always looked at him in contempt. What crime did he commit that his birth was treated like the plague? Naruto figured his parents must have done something horrible. They either died or abandoned him, making the villagers punish him for their actions. Naruto looked at the state of his desolate apartment room. The refrigerator, although in working condition, was mostly empty. Luckily, the cabinets were filled up to the brim with ramen cups. The day he discovered the food of the gods was the second happiest day of his life. Not only was it cheap, but it tasted amazing. The small brown table that he owned was found in a nearby garbage heap. Cuts of all sizes decorated the table, as if it was made that way. His sofa was something he found in one of the abandoned rooms. At first it was in good condition, but now cotton stuffing is stewed out from the openings. One day, someone snuck into his apartment and ruined all of his furniture with a sharp object. Naruto could have asked the Hokage for help getting furniture, but he didn't want to bother the old man who had an entire village to run. Deciding a shower was the best course of action, Naruto placed his orange monstrosity, as his teachers called it, into the washer. After a long shower, Naruto wore a white sleeveless shirt along with black shorts. As he placed his orange outfit in the dryer for use tomorrow, he remembered the book that Mikoto gave him. Grabbing the book, the blonde headed into his room. His room was vacant besides a single brown dresser and a spring mattress. Both were in decent condition that he had found in the other apartment rooms. Plopping down on the bed, he looked at the book. Naruto hated books with a passion. To him, it was all a bunch of big words mixed together to make long sentences. Whenever he asked the teachers to explain them, they would spurn him and called him an idiot for not understanding. With reluctance, the blonde opened the first page of the book. A note fell from the book and landed on his stomach. Naruto grabbed the note and read its contents. To Naruto-kun, if you found this note, then you listened to me and attempted to read the book. Great job on following my orders, and you avoided punishment when we meet tomorrow. Naruto sweat dropped in that sentence. Mikoto was such a nice person, there was no way she was going to punish him right. Shaking his thoughts, he continued reading the rest of the note. I know some words will be difficult for you to understand, so I want you to write down those words on a piece of paper, and we'll discuss them tomorrow. I want you to know that reading this book will help you on the path on to becoming a ninja. If you don't believe me, this was Itachi Kun's first book. Without further ado, finish this book before we see each other tomorrow. Your future sensei, Ichiha Mikoto. Naruto couldn't believe this book was once Itachi's. The male Ichiha was one of the strongest shinobis he had ever met. 
Granted, the blonde hadn't met many shinobis, but he was sure that Itachi was strong. Deciding not to waste any more time, Naruto dove into the first chapter, and began reading silently. A shinobi is a trained warrior that uses chakra. He's not a common bandit because he has a home to protect. That home is Kanahagakur no Sato. Every Kanoha shinobi harbors the will of fire. The will of fire is a belief that every shinobi loves, believes, cherishes, and fights to protect the village, as previous generations had done before them. This belief is what allows Kanoha to survive three great shinobi wars, and invasions from other villages. Naruto brought his hand up to his chest. Is it possible for me to have the will of fire, as well? Can I honestly protect the same people that scorn me? Jiju once said that a Hokage protects his people. Maybe that's the same thing. Naruto thought to himself, as he continued reading the book. While reading, Naruto jotted down several words that he was unsure of on the back of Nakoto's note. Different topics came up in the book such as stealth, traps, chakra, and etc. There was so much that he didn't know. Did his classmates learn this when he wasn't in class? He decided to finish the rest of school to make sure he wasn't late for class the next day. Who knows, maybe I won't be kicked out this time. Naruto thought, as he drifted into slumber. Next day, the sun directed its rays at Naruto's face, causing him to twitch slightly. Blue Cerulean eyes slowly opened, and went towards his alarm clock. Noticing that he was still early, Naruto took a quick shower, and had a ramen breakfast like always. The blonde grabbed the book from his bed, shoved it into his bag, and headed out of his apartment. Before he left, he made sure to lock his door. He didn't want anyone breaking into his apartment again. Finishing his preparations, he scurried off to the academy. When Naruto arrived at the class, he was greeted with an almost empty classroom. It seemed only a few people were here early. Not like any of them were his friends anyway. Naruto moved towards the window seat and pulled out the book and note in case he came across any difficult words. He resumed reading where he left off last night. Naruto didn't notice the perplexed glances that his classmates gave him as they walked into the classroom. Most shrugged it off and went to talk to their friends. The black-haired boy, with his hair styled in a fan fashion, and a brown-haired boy arrived in the classroom together like always. The black-haired boy was Shikamaru, the heir of the Nara clan. The clan was known for their intelligence, and using deer antlers to make medicine. The chubby boy next to him was his best friend, Chaoji. He was the heir of the Akamichi clan, evident by the red swirls on his cheeks. The two clans shared a close bond along with the Yamanaka clan. Shikamaru instantly noticed the oddity, as he spotted the blonde-haired prankster. Chaoji didn't notice, as he was preoccupied with his bag of chips. Chaoji and Shikamaru made their way towards Naruto, and gave him a quick greeting. The three along with Kiba were troublemakers during the early days of the academy. Naruto returned the greeting before immersing himself into the book again. Taking a seat next to the blonde, with Chaoji sitting next to him, Shikamaru looked at the thing that made the hyperactive boy so quiet. I was quietly reading a book titled Shinobi Basics 101 like it was an everyday occurrence. Despite not knowing what caused his friend's sudden change, Shikamaru smirked that Naruto was trying to improve. The Nara air exchanged glances with Chaoji, who seemed to be smiling, as well. Naruto always seemed to find ways to keep Shikamaru interested in his actions. The black-haired boy decided to take a nap, as he wasn't going to solve the mystery known as Naruto anytime soon. His plans were quickly thrown out the window when a raging storm of girls were chasing after a certain Achiha into the classroom. Of course, the two in front of the other girls were a girl with platinum blonde hair, and a girl with cherry blossom pink hair. The platinum blonde girl had her hair tied in a high ponytail with bangs covering the right side of her face. She was Yamanaka Ino, the heiress to the Yamanaka clan. The girl Ino was bickering with was Haruno Sakura. The two were best friends until they discovered that they were crushing on the same boy. Sakura had a big red bow on her head, as her pink hair swooshed in the air. The two girls came barreling into the room, leaving a dust cloud behind them. Can you loud mouth girls shut up? I'm going to go deaf in my ears. Inuzuka Kiba complained while covering his sensitive ears. His Akamaru barked in agreement. His face had the signature Inuzuka's red fang markings on his cheeks. Akamaru, the white, stayed mostly inside Kiba's grey fur-lined hooded coat. Although the rest of the class didn't say anything, they also agreed with Inuzuka's words. Ino and Sakura quickly stood in front of Kiba, with the latter pointing at him. Shut up mutt, I'm not loud. Sakura screeched out, much to the annoyance of everyone. In the corner of her eye, the pink-haired girl spotted Naruto sitting next to Shikamaru and Chaoji. Hey Naruto Baka, what are you doing? The blonde boy turned his attention from the book to Sakura. Oh hey Sakura-chan, how are you today? He was friendly, and greeted with a smile. He didn't catch the insult that she attached to his name. She replied with a fist to Naruto's noggin. I told you not to call me that Baka. Ino chimed into the conversation. Seriously though, what are you doing? She was curious about what made the fellow blonde sit still. Not only he would be too busy plotting some elaborate prank to even attend class. Naruto showed the two girls the book. I'm reading this book. Laughter erupted from the class with the exception of Sasuke, Aburumshino, Shikamaru, Chaoji, and Hayuga Hinata. 
The latter three frowned that everyone was laughing at him. The dead lass is reading. I'm surprised that you even know how to read. Kiba barked in between laughter. I mean how's reading going to help you? You'll always be dead last. More laughter was heard after Kiba spoke. Naruto was livid at his classmates for mocking him. He was simply sitting and quietly reading without bothering anyone. What more could these people want from him? He was about to talk back to Kiba when he was interrupted by a lazy voice. You guys should really shut up. I can't sleep with this racket. Shikamaru said, as he lifted his head up from his napping position. Shikamaru, look at Naruto. The dobe is reading. Inuzuka pointed towards Naruto. I have eyes, I can see that he's reading. Everyone that isn't blind can't see that he's reading. If you look closely at the title of the book he's reading, then you would understand. The class looked at the title of the book that Naruto held. Before anyone could comment, Shikamaru continued talking. Naruto knows that he's currently dead last in the class right now. So what does he do? He's trying to get better so he doesn't stay there. He's actually taking his shinobi career seriously compared to most of you. His lazy voice was somehow able to silence the crowd. The Nara air turned towards the Kiba. Personally I don't understand why you're laughing at Naruto. You're currently the third to dead last in the class, barely ahead of Naruto. Kiba fumed at the end of Shikamaru's words. I don't know why you're talking Shikamaru, you're second to dead last. Kiba smirked at his apparent victory. You're right. The black haired boy agreed. But you don't see me boasting about my position, nor do you see me belittling Naruto. I'm content with doing minimal effort to pass. You, on the other hand, better watch out before Naruto passes you up. The entire class, including Naruto, was stunned silent after Shikamaru finished talking. Before anything else could happen, Iruka and Mizuki walked into the classroom. Iruka's brow rose at the quietness of the classroom, but ignored it to begin today's lecture. Everyone quietly took their seats. Ino and Sakura didn't argue about who sat next to Sasuke either. Iruka began today's lecture on the elemental nations. Naruto regained his composure as soon as the teacher started. He flashed a genuine smile instead of his usual fake smile. Thanks for helping me out of Shikamaru. Shikamaru just smirked at the blonde. What are friends for? The pineapple hat then laid his head down and drifted off into his nap. Chouji held out his chip bag towards Naruto, an Akamichi sign of friendship. Naruto took a chip from the bag and nodded a thank you to Chouji. They both smiled and returned their attention elsewhere. Chouji went back to eating his chips, while Naruto just smiled with the thought of friends. After school, Naruto rushed to training ground 11 as soon as class ended. Class was refreshing as he actually learned something and wasn't kicked out by the teachers. After some searching, he finally found the grounds he was looking for. When he entered the training ground, the blonde saw Makoto. Training ground 11 was ordinary compared to the other grounds. It was an empty grass field with nothing surrounding it. On the edges, there were several benches and tables. Instead of a training ground, it looked more like a park. Hello, Makoto-san. The boy shouted as he headed towards the woman. She returned the greeting with a smile. How are you, Naruto-kun? I had an awesome day. Today I read the book you gave me in class, but people laughed at me. Naruto frowned as he recalled the incident. Mikoto frowned as well, but decided to let them continue talking. My friend Shikamaru told off the people who laughed at me. I didn't even know we were friends. Plus Chaoji gave me a chip from his chip bag, which means we're friends too. Oh, and Chaoji is an Akamichi, just in case he didn't know. I was able to learn something in class, and I wasn't even kicked out. The hyperactive blonde rambled on. Mikoto continued to frown at some of the things she heard, but didn't pursue the topic. The woman simply patted his head, glad that he was happy. Alright Naruto-kun since you're so happy today, how about we go buy you some new clothes? She suggested. Naruto looked at her oddly. What's wrong with my current clothes? He said, as he looked at his favorite outfit. Mikoto shook her head. Naruto-kun, a good ninja, needs to use stealth by blending into the environment. Bright orange basically paints a target on you. She hoped to reason with him. As much as Naruto liked oranges, he knew Mikoto had a valid point. The problem is that shops don't let me buy anything. If they did let me buy stuff, it's really overpriced. This jumpsuit was the cheapest thing I could buy. Makoto stared at the ground impassively, but inside was a tornado of emotions. How dare the civilians treat a young child like this? The amount of hate he's receiving for something he has no control over is ridiculous. The Chiha woman steeled her emotions as she looked back up at him. Come Naruto-kun, I know a shop that will sell you things at a fair price. She gestured to the boy. Naruto stood rooted to his spot. Mikoto-san, well I appreciate it, why are you so nice to me? The boy asked. He was unused to this level of kindness. First she offered to train him, and now she was taking him shopping. The Chiha woman frowned once again. He's so used to being ignored by the village that he doesn't know how to perceive kindness without being suspicious. Kashina-chan, I regret not being there for your son earlier. Mikoto apologized to her friend, hoping for her forgiveness. naruto kun I'm doing this because I want to. She assured him. Naruto tilted his head in confusion, but decided not to think too much about it. 
well let me go grab my money before we head off. Before Makoto could protest, Naruto dashed away towards his apartment. After 5 minutes, he returned, and they headed off to the shop. As they walked, villagers and shinobi alike gave them odd looks. They were all wondering what the Chiha matriarch was doing with the demon brat. Makoto ignored their stares as they kept walking. Eventually, they stopped outside a shop called Higurashi's Weapons, where a young brown-haired girl was attending the counter. Her hair was styled uniquely into buns. Hello Tenten-chan, can you call your parents for me? Makoto asked the girl now known as Tenten. The girl bowed before scurrying up the stairs to retrieve her parents. Soon a middle-aged man and woman, along with Tenten appeared. Welcome to our store Makoto-sama. The man bowed. The man, who had a muscular build, was wearing blue overalls over his white shirt. His overalls were plastered with soot, giving him a dirty look. Black goggles were lifted above his green eyes. His most prominent features were his bald head and brown, neck-length beard. Gijiya san I told you not to call me Sama. Mikoto-san is fine. She reminded me before turning to the middle-aged woman. Good afternoon, Tara-san. The woman known as Tara was dressed elegantly in a kimono. The black kimono was decorated with a blue flower pattern. It matched the woman's dark blue eyes. Her brown hair was tied in a bun with a pair of silver hair sticks sticking out. Hello Mikoto-san, what can we do for you today? Tara friendly asked. Actually, I would like you to help me with this one here. Mikoto ushered Naruto to the front. Tara and Kajiya instantly recognized who the boy was. The duo stared at Naruto, and he began to feel anxious under their gaze. What is that monstrosity that you're wearing as a young man? Tara said, as she looked at the jumpsuit with disgust. No, don't answer, we'll get you new clothes immediately. Tenten, please get my tools. She told her daughter, who went to grab the tools. Young man, I need you to strip. Naruto looked at her with shock and fear in his eyes. He quickly ran behind Mikoto to hide from the tailor. Naruto-kun, it's okay. Mikoto reassured him. She just wants to measure your body to make sure your new clothes fit. Naruto saw Tara nod in confirmation from behind the Chiha woman. Trusting Mikoto, he slowly took off his jacket and shirt. Instantly the temperature in the store dropped several degrees, and killing intent leaked out from the three adults. Everyone stared at Naruto's body with utter horror. His body was so skinny that you could see several outlines of bones. His arms looked like they would snap in half like twigs. His ribcage was in full display while his stomach was caved in. His entire figure looked like it could shatter into pieces if slightly touched. How he was able to look like that and be alive was a complete mystery. Naruto and Tenten shuddered under the killing intent. The boy collapsed onto his knees from the pressure and began holding his body to stop the shaking. Seeing this, the adults immediately regretted their actions. Mikoto rushed to console Naruto while Tara did the same with Tenten. Kiji stood there and shook his head in disappointment. The Chiha woman broke the silence as she released Naruto from the hug. Naruto-kun what do you eat to look like that? Mikoto didn't want to know, fearing what he would say. But the information needed to be known so she could properly help him. I eat ramen every day, and that's pretty much it. Naruto answered sincerely. Mikoto didn't like his response. Don't you eat anything other than ramen? The Chiha asked. Naruto shook his head negatively. I can't buy anything else at stores because they're either too expensive or spoiled. The boy confessed. Mikoto felt rage build up, and did her best to suppress it, so she wouldn't frighten Naruto again. Hearing his words, Tenten rushed up the stairs, and returned later with a bag of snacks. Here take this. They're mine, but you look like you need them more than me. Tenten handed him her private stash of snacks. Are you sure I can take this? Naruto questioned, to which she nodded. Thanks. I'm Uzumaki Naruto. Higurashi Tenten. The girl pointed to herself. Let's go get you a new set of clothes so I can burn those. Tenten dragged him along, followed by her mother. While waiting on him, Mikoto grabbed a kunai and shuriken set, a first aid kit, several sealing paper, two bottles of ink, a brush, and a chakra bakken. She dropped all of the items at the cash register. Several minutes later, Naruto came out from the back. He wore a dark blue shirt that was covered by an unzipped black jacket that had a large orange uzumaki swirl on the back. He had on black pants with orange streaks going along the side of each pants leg with matching combat boots. He replaced his old goggles with a dark blue variety that hangs loosely on his neck. The outfit was honestly a little big on Naruto, but hopefully he would grow into it. Much better Naruto-kun, do you like your new outfit? Mikoto asked the newly outfitted boy. I do, but I think it needs more orange. Naruto was pleased, but he needed more of his favorite color. Unfortunately the store didn't seem to possess many things of the orange variety. The older woman chuckled at the response. Well I think you look quite handsome in them. Mikoto complimented, causing Naruto to blush. Terasan, can we have several pairs of these clothes? She asked the tailor. Tara and Tenten went off to retrieve the supplies, while Naruto made his way to the counter. What is all this stuff for? Naruto mused. I will explain this stuff to you later after we head to a few other places. Don't worry, you'll need these supplies for later. Mikoto answered while Tara and Tenten returned with the clothes. Kiji rang them up at the counter. 
Since you're a new customer, I'll make 40% off the final price. It will come to 40,000 yen in all. Naruto retrieved his overstuffed frog wallet and pulled out the money. Makoto was shocked at the amount of money that Naruto had, but chose not to dwell on it. Alright I put all your things in this ceiling scroll, you just add chakra to take them out. Come see us anytime you need anything. The blacksmith said. Naruto nodded and waved goodbye to the Higurashi family. Tenten quickly gave him a hug, which caused Naruto to blush slightly, and told him to start eating better. He promised that he would eat better after seeing everyone's expressions. Mikoto and Naruto made several more pit stops along the way. Naruto was introduced to the library, where Mikoto required him to read one book every week from the civilian section. As he went to check out the books that Mikoto gave him, the librarian stopped him from checking out the book. Mikoto quickly gave her a glare, and promised to tell the Hokage about the transaction, which prompted the librarian to let Naruto check them out. They then went grocery shopping for Naruto, who received the ire from other customers. Quick glares from the Ichiha woman made them cower away in fear. Placing the groceries in a ceiling scroll, they headed back to training ground 11. The duo sat on a bench, and relaxed under the sun. So what's all this stuff from Higurashi's for? Naruto asked, as he unsealed the items. Well Naruto, a long time ago there was once a village called Uzushiagakur near Kurigakur. In that village was the Uzumaki clan, who was famous for its Yunjutsu and Kenjutsu. Fearing the Uzumaki, three of the major five elemental nations, attacked Uzushiagakur during the Second Great Ninja War. Unfortunately Kanahagakur wasn't fast to aid our allies, and Uzushiagakur fell. Although in the end they won, the three nations that attacked, lost 90% of their troops. This allowed Kanahagakur to quickly win the war over the other villages. The Uzumaki clan no longer exists, but some of the people were able to flee in time. I figured that you would want to continue your clan's history. Nakoto finished her history lesson. Naruto soaked in all the information, and a grin appeared on his face. Although sad that his clan was destroyed, Naruto still held out hope. There was a chance that someone related to him existed. I've decided. He announced. Along with my dream to become Hokage, I'll also look for other Uzumaki members. I'm going to learn the Sunjutsu thing, and Kenjutsu to honor my clan. Makoto smiled at his proclamation. I knew you would say that. That was why I got you sealing paper, and a chakra bakken, along with introductory Fuenjutsu, and Kenjutsu books. She said, holding up each item. Now Naruto-kun, Fuenjutsu is a very dangerous art, you must promise me that you'll be very careful while learning it. Yes Makoto-san, I'll be extremely careful. What is Fuenjutsu anyway? Naruto asked. Fuenjutsu is the art of sealing. It's very complex, so complex that it's considered a dying art. That being said, Fuenjutsu is very helpful, as you can tell with the ceiling scrolls. Mikoto commented. She also told Naruto that there was also a Fuenjutsu expert in Konoha, but he wasn't in town at the moment. I guess I'll ask Hokage Jiji about Fuenjutsu when he has time. What is a chakra bakken? He asked. Naruto knew what they were separately, but not together. Mikoto held up the bakken. If you apply chakra to this bakken, it would get heavier. This is used so you can get used to the weight of a real katana when you manage to get one. It's mainly used for training purposes. She explained. He then asked Mikoto if she knew any Kenjutsu teachers. The Ichiha shook her head no, but said that there were plenty of Kenjutsu users in Konoha, so he might see one someday. While Mikoto was a Kenjutsu user, her style relied on the use of her Shuringen. They then reviewed the book that Naruto read yesterday. They went over the words he didn't understand, and reread the more important chapters. So when am I going to learn super awesome Naruto asked with sparkles in his eyes. Before I answer that, Naruto-kun can you tell me what the three basic academies are? Mikoto asked. It's Kowarimi no Jutsu, Bunsha no Jutsu, Clone Technique, and Henge no Jutsu, Transformation Technique. Naruto answered. Well did you know that when I was on active duty, my alias was Kowarimi no Megami? Mikoto said. Although she wasn't exactly proud of the name, she was hoping to get his interest. Naruto stared at her like she was crazy. Why are you called that? The blonde wondered. There's so many that are much cooler than the Kowarimi no Jutsu. Mikoto nodded at his question. You're right Naruto-kun. There are tons of cooler out there, but the Kawarimi no Jutsu can save his user. Even if you have something cool to use, most of them can't help you escape from certain death. That's why I trained until I mastered the technique, and was able to escape my enemies countless times. Just because one isn't as cool as another doesn't mean it isn't as useful. If you master a low rank, and know how to use it well, isn't that better than using a high rank at half the power? She finished. Naruto processed everything that Mikoto had said. It was true that every ninja knew Kawarimi no Jutsu because of how useful it was. You're right Mikoto-san. I'll master the low rank first before trying to learn the high rank. Mikoto smiled at the young boy. If you master the low rank, the high rank becomes easier to learn. Plus, there are so many low ranks out there that you can have a variety of differences. You'll truly be the most unpredictable ninja out there. She incited him. Naruto loved the sound of that. He hugged Mikoto, as a thank you. Mikoto could only return the hug she received from her best friend's son. 
Okay, we're going to start training, and I expect you to work hard. Naruto got up, confidence saluting from his body. Yes, Makoto sensei, I would be the best Hokage there ever was. Several months later, the past couple months were the happiest Naruto had ever felt in his life. The first time everyone saw his new clothes, they didn't initially recognize him. Shikamaru smirked and said, You never cease to interest me, Naruto. He was getting closer to his friends, Shikamaru and Chaoji. The blonde was even invited to their homes a couple of times. He enjoyed playing shogi with Shikamaru even though he always lost. The Naruto boy had to go into his thinking pose several times when playing against Naruto due to the blonde's unpredictable nature. With Choji, they had eating contests and were currently tied. Naruto finally found someone to share his love of the food of the gods. Naruto frequently ate at restaurants that the Akamichi owned because of the good food and the fact that he was welcomed there. The blonde also made friends with Shino and Hinata. Shino was the heir to the Aburam clan, while Hinata was the heiress of the Hyuga clan. Shino had bushy brown hair and often wore a pair of black sunglasses. He and Shino become quick friends when Naruto caught a golden Hercules beetle in the forest and brought it to class. The Aburamara asked if he could have the beetle to see if could crossbreed with him. Naruto obliged since he was going to release it anyway. That was the day that the blonde swore that Shino's eyes shine bright, even though he was wearing shades. They got along well despite Naruto's hyperactiveness and Shino's stoic nature, as they both shared a logical look at life. Hinata had short dark blue hair and was usually shy. Having Hinata as a friend was initially weird, due to the fact that she constantly fainted whenever they would talk. She fainted less now, but still blushed red quite often. They found that they both had a love for reading, and even exchanged books from time to time. Naruto actually enjoys reading a lot more now. He felt that he could immerse himself in a book, and felt less lonely when reading. Tenten would help him with his target throwing, and would spar with Naruto on occasion. They often sparred with Bakkins, with the girls showing him different styles. Some days they would just relax, and talk about their respective classes. Naruto found out that he was held back a year by Chichi because he and Tenten were the same age. His training was going well if he said so himself. Naruto was no longer the dead last, but was still near the lower half of the class. Kiba was furious that he was passed by the former dead last, but could no longer say anything about it without being called a hypocrite. Iruka enjoyed that the blonde started paying attention during his lectures, and was even friendlier towards Naruto. Nakoto trained him in studies, stealth, traps, and the three basic academy jutsus. The training in stealth and traps was great for his pranks. Since he never got caught, like Jiji said, he never got punished for his pranks. The Kakuramino no Jutsu, Cloak of Invisibility technique, greatly helped in the endeavor. Even though the whole village knew it was him, no one was able to catch him in the act. Anbu were on high alert after he had pranked their headquarters. All he did was apply itch powder to their uniforms. They even began using hard code words for situations involving him. True to his word, he never pranked the Ichiha compound again. He only pranked some Ichihas that irritated him. His training in the Academy Jutsu was going well, except for the bunch of no Jutsu. He was going to have to find a way to conquer it before graduation. He was able to master his first, Nawanuk no Jutsu, rope escape technique, due to the fact Mikoto-san would make him escape from all kinds of bindings, and in all sorts of positions. He questioned the usefulness of this, but Mikoto pointed it out to him. With this, he would be able to quickly escape if taken hostage or pretend to be captured, so he could be led into enemy headquarters. Once inside, he could escape with valuable information or take down the boss. Naruto then knew any could be helpful depending on the situation. Now he was working on the Kawarimi no Jutsubi replacing himself with objects that were far away. Although he sparred with Tenten, he was still unable to find a Kinjutsu teacher. This resulted in him only doing practice swings with his Bakken. He read about different styles, but wasn't sure which one was right for him. Naruto decided to postpone it until he found a Kinjutsu expert. His Hyunjutsu, on the other hand, was going great. After practicing his calligraphy for nearly two months, he was finally able to write without messing up. The blonde was still on level 1, which was identifying simple seals, but he was on his way to level 2. The Hokage helped him maintain a steady hand, and even suggested writing with his left hand, as well. His reasoning was that his right hand might be occupied during battle, so he might need to write seals with his left. His physical health was getting back to where he should be. He read a book on how to remain in ninja shape after recovering from an injury. Although he wasn't injured, the method helped him regardless. Mikoto gave him cooking lessons so the blonde could be self-sufficient. His new diet allowed him to gain pounds, and he started to fill his clothing. That being said, the blonde was still the shortest in his class. He was exercising regularly, and was doing lots of running to increase his stamina. Using Henge, Naruto was now able to buy food and clothing at normal prices. Naruto marched on towards training grounds 11, but noticed several villagers and ninja's solemn expressions. Today was a beautiful day with a few clouds in the air. Why were they so sad? Deciding it would be best to ignore the villagers, Naruto proceeded to the training grounds where Makoto would be. 
As soon as he arrived, she was nowhere in sight. Could she be stuck at home? No, she would have told me beforehand at least. Naruto pondered when the Hokage came up to him. Naruto, I guess you haven't heard yet. Here is an ass despite knowing the answer. What are you talking about, Gigi? Naruto was confused by the Hokage's question. What haven't I heard? He asked before thinking to himself. The old man's acting weird as well, what's going on? Follow me Naruto, and don't ask anything until we get there. Here is an gesture to Naruto. They walked silently the whole way, even the villagers didn't pay him a passing glance. They arrived at the cemetery, and here is an stopped at a tombstone. On it read, here lies Achiha Mikoto, a loving wife and mother, as well as a strong Kanoichi of Kanahagakur no Seido. They che Jiji, this is just a prank all right. It's probably punishment for all the pranks I did. I'm sorry for whatever I did, but this is going too far. I mean I just saw Mikoto-san yesterday. There's no way she's dead. She looked just fine yesterday. Naruto stuttered over his words. He knew it was a lie, it had to be. Naruto, yesterday night Ichiha Tachi murdered everybody in the Ichiha clan, except for Ichiha Sasuke. We have no idea why he did it, but we'll ask Sasuke when he wakes up from his comatose state. I'm sorry to say that this isn't a prank. The Hokage said softly, not wanting to hurt his surrogate grandson. Naruto collapsed onto the ground, his entire world shattering. There's no way Itachi Nai would do something like that. He's one of the kindest people I know. Why would he kill everyone, especially his mother Naruto was at a loss for words. What was he trying to achieve? I don't understand what's going on anymore. Naruto's tears escaped his eyes, and fell on the ground. Inside Harrison was filled with guilt. Thanks to his incompetence, Danzo was able to order Tachi to kill every single Ichiha to prevent a coup d'etat. He deemed himself guilty for the lives of all that died, and the three affected most by their deaths. Itachi would be forced to live on the run, be pursued by hunter nins, and deal with the turmoil that comes from killing his clan. Sasuke would live thinking that he was the last loyal Ichiha, and be faced with loneliness that he had never experienced before. He would also question why Itachi left him alive, and possibly seek out revenge against his brother. Naruto lost his mother, an older brother figure in a single night. Unlike Sasuke, he dealt with loneliness before, but that didn't make it any less difficult. Here is a notice that Naruto was beginning to truly smile at people since Makoto came into his life. Sande knelt down and hugged his surrogate grandson, who was crying profusely. The Hokage cursed his inability to do anything right. He had failed Minato, Kashina, Naruto, and now the entire Chiha clan. Resolving to change, a fire was born within Hirazan. He wouldn't fail no one else, and Danzo would come to fear why he was known as the Shinobi no Kami. Two weeks had passed since the Ichiha massacre, and life in Kanahagakur had slowly returned to normalcy. Ichiha Itachi was placed in the bingo book as an S-class missing ninja for massacring the Ichiha clan. Ichiha Sasuke was placed under the care of elders, Yudatin Kaharu and Mitakado Himura, until he was 16 or became a genin. He was asked questions about Itachi as soon as he woke. Sasuke responded with fits of anger when Itachi's name was brought up. Many civilians deemed it taboo to speak of Itachi's name in front of Sasuke when they saw how he reacted. Sasuke was readmitted into the academy as soon as he was deemed healthy. During his recovery, his fan club grew to insane proportions. Fangirls and fanboys were hoping to help the tragic hero and constantly hounded him with gifts. The boy, however, paid them no attention and trained constantly when he wasn't attending classes. A protagonist hadn't been attending class. He remained locked up in his room and only came out when summoned by the Hokage. Hiruzen was worried about his surrogate grandson and would often take him out to eat ramen. Naruto would eat a single bowl of ramen, thank the Hokage, and return home. Aum and Tuchi were worried sick about their favorite customer. Naruto woke up from his slumber. To him, time seemed still, and nothing was worth getting up for. He missed talking to Itachi and training with Mikoto. Why did Itachi Nai do it? I don't believe it was to test his powers like the villagers are saying. Itachi Nai is too kind for that. There's no way he was faking all of that. He loved Konoha as much as the next person. He would do anything for Konoha. Naruto tried to decipher Itachi's actions, but was coming up blank. The light knock came from his door, and Naruto grudgingly got up to open the door for Sandane. Except the person behind the door wasn't the Hokage, but his lazy Nara friend. Hey Shikamaru, what are you doing here? The blonde boy asked. Shikamaru said nothing while his eyes began scanning Naruto. Mom told me to come get you for dinner at our place, you troublesome blonde. The black-haired boy sighed at his friend. This was the first time he had seen the blonde in two weeks, but Naruto looked like a shell of himself. Naruto's clothes were ruffled, and he had major bags under his eyes. Most likely from the lack of sleep, and crying, seeing as his eyes were still red. Sorry Shika, tell your mom that I'll come another time. The blonde refused the offer, and was going to close the door until a hand stopped it. Naruto, you don't understand what that troublesome woman would do to me if I don't bring you. Look, I know you don't want to go, but do it, as a favor for me. Shikamaru pleaded. Naruto sighed, and nodded. He told Shikamaru to wait for him to get dressed. 
In about 15 minutes, the duo headed towards the Nara compound. On their way there, villagers directed their scorn at the young. At least that's one thing that won't change anytime soon. Hopefully Shikamaru won't notice, but I doubt it. He's way too perspective not to. Naruto thought, as he walked. Like the blonde thought, Shikamaru did notice that their glasses were directed to his friend. Those glasses always appear whenever I'm with Naruto. Is it because of the pranks that he did? No, even a prank couldn't produce a look like that. Does it have something to do with the graffiti on his apartment wall? They were calling him a demon, and telling him to die. Plus, all the adults seem to know something our generation doesn't. As always everything with Naruto is so troublesome. Shikamaru's thoughts ceased, as the duo arrived at the compound. Shikamaru directed Naruto to the backyard of the main house. Surprise. Multiple voices rang out, as soon as Naruto came into view. Naruto stood there shocked at the people he saw. He saw his friends, and most of their parents along with Aim, Tuchi, the Hokage, and Iruka. He looked up to see a banner that read. Happy 10th birthday Naruto. The boy had completely forgotten all about his birthday. Today was October the 10th, his birthday, as well as the day Kayubi attacked Kanoha. It was also the day the Yandame Hokage died, killing the Kayubi. A minute passed, and no reaction came from Naruto. A slap hit the back of his head, releasing him from his stupor. He looked at Shikamaru who was giving a wordless look, well say something, you troublesome blonde. Naruto gave a wide grin, and shouted his thanks for everyone to hear. His friends, and Ino ran up to him, and congratulated him on getting a year older. They even told him they got him presents. Naruto never got a birthday party or presents before. He had no idea what to do so he thanked them again. The party went into full swing, and Naruto quickly forgot the sadness that plagued him for the last two weeks. Tsuchi and Aim gave him a personalized ramen bowl that was decorated with fish cakes, before they had to leave to open up the shop. Hiruzen wished him a happy birthday, and told Naruto to meet him in his office for his present before he headed home. The blonde boy was happy that he was able to spend his birthday with people other than just the sanding. He ate lots of cake and ice cream, and was hyperactive the entire time, much to the disdain of the adults. Finally it was time to open the rest of the presents. Ino was the first to give her a present. It was a purple hyacinth in a pot. It means forgiveness in flower language. I hope you can forgive me for being mean to you all of these years. She apologized. Naruto looked at her, and smiled. It's okay Ino, how about we become friends? Ino nodded, and gave her own smile. I would like Naruto very much Naruto. Anoichi and Noriko when Yamanaka nodded their heads, although for different reasons. The two Yamanaka were wearing yellow yukata with a purple flower design. Noriko had her brown hair tied in a bun with chopsticks holding it in place. Noriko was happy that her daughter gained a friend, while Anoichi was happy that nothing was going on between Naruto and his princess. Shikaku and Choza shook their heads at their friend's obvious happiness. Noriko gave Naruto a stack of slips. I wasn't sure what to get you. The scarred face Shunin admitted. The blonde boy opened the stacks to reveal a free bowl at Ichiraku's ramen. There's 50 slips in there. Any more, and you'll clean out my wallet. Iruka chuckled, as Naruto went airborne to give him a hug. Thank you Iruka sensei. He thanked his instructor. Chaoji gave him a one day, all you can eat pass at any Akamichi restaurant of his choosing. You better tell your chefs to be ready because we're going to have an eating contest soon. Naruto challenged his big bone friend. You going down. This will break our tie. Chaoji shouted back. Choza and Chihiro one Akamichi grew pale, and were rapidly making plans to gather extra supplies. The two Akamichi were wearing white yukatas that were decorated with red swirls, the Akamichi symbol. Chihiro's short black hair had a red flower clipped on. Hanada gave him the latest book in the Doki Doki series. The series was immensely popular with the female population, and rivaled the Icha Icha series in sales. Thanks to Hanada, I didn't know a new book had come out. He thanked her. Naruto didn't understand the series much, but he didn't want to make Hanada sad. It also gave them a topic to talk about. Ah no, it came out a week ago. Hinata said while she twirled her fingers. That clicked something within Naruto's head. While he was inside the sanctuary of his apartment, many things happened that he didn't know about. I h hope you like your present Naruto. She stuttered. Hinata didn't notice Naruto's change in expression. Naruto wore his mask once again, and smiled at Hinata. Thanks Hinata, we'll talk about it after I finish reading it. They thanked her once more. Naruto didn't have time to dwell on his thoughts, as Shino came up to him. Naruto-san, I once again wish to congratulate you on your day of birth. Before I give you your present, I shall inform you about the status of the golden Hercules beetle that you gave me. The beetle and I were able to produce a new breed of insect. The Abira mare said with no change in his voice. Shino held out his index finger, and out came a larger that had a golden shell. Instantly the women fled from the two boys. Naruto noticed a slight tick mark forming on Shino's head. Shino, first off, I told you to call me Naruto. Secondly, isn't it really hard to assimilate with new insects? Thirdly, what does it do? Finally, that's so cool. Glad I was able to help you out, Shino. The blonde commented. 
Naruto saw Shino revert back to his stoic state, although he seemed happier now. The blonde wasn't sure if he was right because no one could really tell Apurum's expressions. Yes, you did tell me to call you without honorifics, and I will remember it the next time we speak. It is indeed difficult to assimilate with a new species, but these are the offspring of my own. That allowed the process to be easier than normally. I have yet to discover their abilities, but regardless, a new species is an exciting event in my clan. Shino answered. Everyone else had a single thought, of course your clan would get excited about bugs. This is the present that I wish to give you. Shino grabbed a ring, and handed it to Naruto. This ring is given to the allies of the Aburum clan. Inside the ring is the pheromon of a female that can be released by applying chakra to it. When it is released, insects will surround you, and form a cocoon to protect you from harm. While it is not an effective defense, it should be able to survive a single attack. The shade-wearing boy explained. Naruto stared at the ring, and Shino white-eyed. The ring was white with an engraving of a black on it. Are you sure you want to give this to me? I mean this is obviously important. He was unsure if he could accept this present. Naruto, not only did you help me discover a new species, but you have never once treated me or my clan like freaks. That is more than enough for me to trust you. If you decline, that means you don't deem my clan as worthy allies. Shino said with no emotion. Naruto frowned at Shino's comments. Of course I think of your clan as worthy allies. I'll gladly accept this ring, thank you Shino. Naruto said, as he slipped the ring onto his middle finger on his left hand. Shino nodded, as well as his father. Shibi approved of his son's choice, and was glad that he was able to find a trustworthy friend. Shibi was present with his normal jonin outfit, the typical Aburam attire. Tenten was next to give Naruto his present. Well I was actually planning to give you something else, but dad told me not to. He says to visit him tomorrow for something I can't tell you. She told him. Naruto was confused by her words, but allowed her to continue nonetheless. Anyway, I got you this book, since I know you're almost finished with level 1. Tenten said, as she revealed a book titled, Fuinjutsu Level 2. Try not to blow yourself up. Naruto was ecstatic about this present, since he no longer needed to wait until he was a genin to borrow a copy from the library. He hugged Tenten tightly, as a thank you. This set off a chain of reactions from everyone. Tenten flushed red from being hugged by a boy in public. Hinata was paralyzed, and extremely jealous that she wasn't in Tenten's position. Ino's eyes had gained a strange gleam. The younger boys knew Naruto was just being friendly. The adults, on the other hand, were snickering at the two kids. Naruto pulled back, and tilted his head in confusion. Suddenly he remembered something from the Doki Doki series. Girls often blushed when hugged by boys in public or by someone they like. Naruto didn't know which one Tenten was blushing about, so he did what boys his age did. He proceeded to blush the color of a ripe tomato. The cough from Shikamaru compassed the two ten-year-olds. Thanking Tenten once again, and promising to visit tomorrow, he turned to the Nars. Thank you for allowing my birthday party to be here, Shikaku-san, and Yoshino-san. Naruto bowed to the husband and wife. The two Naras were wearing plain black yukatas. Yoshino had argued with her husband to get a more decorative yukata, but he was too lazy to choose. The Nara woman had her long brown hair straightened instead of the usual ponytail. Yoshino ran up to him, and pulled him into a motherly hug. You know you're always welcome here, Nara-chan. She teased. Yoshino-san, don't call me that, it's embarrassing. He sent the male Naras a look, requesting help. They looked away, whistling, as if they didn't know what was going on. Sorry Naruto, she's just too troublesome to deal with. The male Naris thought collectively. Shikaku and Shikamaru didn't want to deal with the wrath of the woman. Naruto looked betrayed, and he cursed his fate. Anyway, Shikamaru also brought you a present. Yoshino said, as she let him go, much to Naruto's relief. I don't have a present to give Naruto. Shikamaru said dryly. What do you mean, you didn't get one of your best friends a present? The Nara matriarch fumed, as she pulled Shikamaru by the ear. It was too troublesome to get him a present. Shikamaru remarked, as he rubbed his sore ear. Naruto frowned that one of his best friends thought it was too troublesome to get him a present. The blonde smiled at Shikamaru nonetheless, since Shikamaru's friendship was a good enough gift. It's alright Shika, I'll kick your ass in Shoji next time. Naruto proclaimed. Shikamaru smirked at Naruto. I can't wait for that day to come. Although Yoshino was mad at her son, she knew nothing could be done about it. The party continued on into the night. Naruto helped clean up, and once again thanked the Naras before heading off to the Hokage Tower. Naruto knocked on the door, and was given permission to come in. Inside his grandfather's figure was doing paperwork yet again. Oh happy birthday my boy, and it's good to see you again. Harazan came, and gave Naruto a hug before retreating back to his desk. Naruto sat on a chair in front of the desk, and waited for Sanding. Harazan dismissed the Anbu from their posts, and activated the privacy seals. Before the Hokage could speak, a blur from the corner of the room smashed into the bookcase. By the bookcase was a man with long white hair, and a gigantic scroll on his back holding up an Anbu member with a blank mask by the neck. The white-haired man was Jiraiya of the Sanin, and the author of Naruto's Ninjutsu books. 
He had on a green kimono shirt with matching pants. A sleeveless red Hayori was worn over his shirt. On his forehead was a hit I ate with the word oil, instead of the usual leaf symbol. Jiraiya snapped the Angu's neck in a quick fashion. Good thing I was in the room sensei or we would have been spied on. The body was sealed into a scroll of Jiraiya's and given to an Anbu member that it returned when hears and deactivated his privacy seals. After the Anbu left, the Jiraiya activated his own seals. Just in case sensei. We don't want the stuff we're talking about coming out of this room. Naruto sat there confused about what was going on. The Toad Sage then took a seat next to Naruto. Happy birthday, Gaki. Jiraiya told Naruto. Thanks Jiraiya-sama, but do I know you? Naruto asked, which made Jiraiya laugh in amusement. So you know about the great Jiraiya-sama? The Sanin puffed out his chest. But your questions will be answered soon. Jiraiya said since they had more pressing matters. The Hokage coughed to get the two's attention. Naruto, I've been hiding a lot of things from you, and I want to make it up to you by telling the truth. I know you have a lot of questions, and I'll answer them, but don't interrupt me until I've finished talking. What I'm about to tell you doesn't leave this room, understand? Hiruzen spoke seriously to get his word across. Naruto nodded in agreement, and kept his silence. Hiruzen took a long drag from his pipe before he spoke. I'm sure you're wondering why the villagers hated you since the day you were born. On the day you were born, the Kyubi no Yuko attacked Kanahagakur. It tore the village apart with ease, and was about to release its strongest attack on the village. Luckily, the Yandame was able to teleport the beast away from the village. In the history books, it says that the Yandame defeated the Kyubi. That's not the truth, and I was the one who fabricated it. The Kyubi isn't actually alive, it's simply a ball of chakra or biju. Since it isn't alive, it cannot be killed. The Yandame was forced to seal the beast into a newborn baby in exchange for his life. The baby he put the Kyubi in was Naruto. You the Kyubi no Yuko. The Sandame concluded. To say that Naruto was stunned, was a massive understatement. His entire core was shell-shocked from the news, and he could see why the villagers glared at him. They think I'm the Kyubi, the same beast that killed all of their loved ones. Are they right? Am I the Kyubi that terrorized Kanoha? His thoughts were interrupted by Jiraiya. I've heard that you're learning Fujinjutsu, so you should know the difference between a scroll and a kunai. Jiraiya stated. In this case, Yurei and serve as the scroll to Kyubi's kunai. Naruto slowly nodded, as he knew the difference, but wasn't fully convinced. Would say, and is the seal secure? Hiruzen decided to answer his question. As a human sacrifice made to hold a biju. Including you, there are eight others spread out throughout the entire elemental nations. Of all the seals, yours is the most secure since Yandame was a level 10 Fujinjutsu master. Naruto's eyes widened over the fact that there were others like him. Would they hate it, and scorn just, as he was. Are all treated this way, and why do the villagers attack me if I'm the one keeping the beast contained? Naruto said calmly, but there was a hint of anger in his voice. If the villagers acted this way towards him, then the others probably had the same or worse treatment. The Jinchuriki's identity is usually kept hidden from the other elemental countries, because they're often targeted for kidnap and assassination. They only know Narashi and Han of Iwagakur, Yugura of Kurigakur, and Karabi of Kumagakur. Not much is known about Rashi and Han, except that they fought in the Third Great Shinobi War. Yugura is the Mizukage of Kurigakur, and Karabi is viewed as a hero in his village, because of his actions in the Third War. Jiraiya said to assure Naruto that not all were treated badly. He did leave out the fact that Yugura was trying to commit genocide against bloodline users. Hiruzen decided to answer the second question. Most villagers and even some ninja don't understand how seals work. As you know, Fujinjutsu is a very complex art that's slowly dying out because not many people can understand it. They cannot fathom how a bunch of lines of ink can possibly hold back a beast such as the Kayubi. I know I cannot possibly tell you to forgive them after all they've done to you. It is okay, Chichi. I can sort of understand why they feel the way they do. They simply fear what they don't understand. Who all knows about my status? Naruto asked. He was worried that everyone knew about him. Only the adults should know about your status, since some shinobi saw the Yandame seal the Kayubi in you. Word was around before I was able to make a law that prohibited anyone to talk about your status, bearing execution. The younger generation doesn't know about it. Hiruzen explained, and he saw the relief that came to Naruto's face. Thank you for finally telling me, and trusting me enough with this secret. Naruto stood up, and bowed deeply. Hiruzen stood up, and sat on the floor in front of Naruto. He bowed with his head on the floor. Naruto after everything I've done to you, yet you still thank me. I don't deserve your thanks, as I'm a failure, as your grandfather. Sandame said. Hiruzen felt hands lifting his head, and the same hands wrapping around his torso. Gigi, don't ever say that. I don't care what anyone else says. You're the best grandfather in the world, and I can't be any happier. Naruto approached. The grandfather and grandson wept in each other's arms. Both were feeling relief for different reasons, but they were happy to have one another. Yuria turned away from the scene to give the two some privacy, while also wiping his own manly tears away. What would his fans say if they caught him crying over such a sappy scene? 
they finally released each other and went back to their respective seats. Smiles graced the faces of the males. But Harazin soon sported a frown. As you now know Naruto, a lot of responsibility has been placed on your shoulders. I'm confident that you can handle it. The Hokage said with pride evident in his voice. Jiji, I know I'm not allowed to tell anyone about this, but can I tell Shikamaru and Shino? They're my best friends, and I trust them not to tell anyone. Naruto pleaded to his grandfather. Hiruzen pondered his surrogate grandson's words. The Toad Sage answered for him. I think it'll be fine for him to tell them sensei. They don't seem to be the type to judge. If he believes that they're trustworthy, why not believe in his choice of friends? Jiraiya proposed. The Hokage nodded yes, but told Naruto it had to be somewhere private. Thank you Jiji, is there anything else you need from me? The blonde asked. Hiruzen nodded. I have another secret I'm keeping from you Naruto, and it's regarding the identity of your parents. I, however, cannot tell you their identities until you reach the rank of Chunin because of certain reasons. Please try to understand that we're doing this for your own good. The Hokage told the blonde. Naruto had only one thought on his mind. Did they, my parents, love me? He asked, hopeful of a good answer. Hiruzen's smile was one of remembrance. They loved you more than anything else. You were their treasure, and they regret not being here to see you grow up. I know if they were here, they would be really proud of you. The Hokage replied. Naruto knew that meant they were dead, but he still smiled, as his parents loved him. Thank you Jiji. That should be everything, I presume. Naruto asked, but the Hokage pointed to his students. I have a present to give you, as well. The present is a godfather, or more specifically, me. Jiraiya shouted, as he struck a pose. Your parents made me your godfather before you were born. Naruto's eyes widened at Jiraiya's words, and quickly narrowed in rage. The young boy got up from his seat, and kicked Jiraiya in the gut before following with an uppercut to the chin. Naruto took out his bakken from his seal, and applied chakra to it, making it the heaviest he could possibly handle. He dashed, and did a side swipe to hit Jiraiya on the side. Naruto huffed, and puffed from the exertion of his actions. Where were you for the past nine years? I had no one that cared about me, except for Jiji, Aim Nisan, Tuchi-san, and Iruka-sensei for eight years. I was beaten, abused, spitted on, ignored or glared at by the villagers every day of my life. My life finally got better when Makoto-san and Itachi Nai came into my life last year. Slowly I started to make friends, and found people that cared about me. Where were you when I desperately needed someone when Makoto-san died two weeks ago? I know I'm just a brat to you, but couldn't you have been in my life just for an hour? I understand that you have lots of duties to perform, as a sanin, but was it that hard to tell me you existed? I'm sorry, but I don't want to see your face anymore today. Naruto ran away from all of his frustrations. The boy stormed out the room, and slammed the door, leaving a downcast at Jiraiya. Here's and watched his students. Why didn't you dodge his attacks? The Hokage inquired. Jiraiya slowly got up from the floor, and sat down on the chair once more. I deserved that beating from him. The Toad Sage replied softly. His hand moved to his side to soothe the pain. Just give him some time to breathe. He doesn't hate you, but it'll take him time to open up to you. Hiruzen said, trying to cheer up his student the best he could. In other news, there's another reason I called you back here besides the fact that it's Naruto's birthday. I want you to bring Tsunade back to Konoha. Sensei, she left here 17 years ago, and I don't think anything is going to bring her back. The white-haired man commented. Jiraiya knew that bringing back his teammate was an extremely difficult task, if not impossible. Tell her that I'll pay her debts with my finances, and that I'll allow for a medicnin program to be made. If she still refuses, she'll be stripped of her rights, as a sanin, and will be declared as a missing nin. Hiruzen responded. Also, tell her that Naruto is alive. He added nonchalantly. Yuraya slammed his hands onto the desk. Are you trying to get me killed, Sirotobi sensei I was already going to get pummeling because of the threat. Now I'm going to be killed, revived, and killed again when I tell her about Naruto. Tsunade was close with Kashina before she left the village with Shizun. She believes that Naruto died along with his parents. As she found out that we've been hiding him from her, we'll essentially be signing our death sentences. The Toad Sage shouted. Being on the receiving end of Tsunade's punches for years, Jiraiya knew how deadly the Slug Princess was. Hiruzen took a drag from his pipe. Trust me, I know what will happen, but I need her here when I finally take down Danzo. Jiraiya sat down with that statement. So you're finally going to kill that old goat. It's about time. I never did like him even though he's helping Kanoha in a way. Hiruzen nodded. I know that he won't be an easy person to take down, so I'll need someone here, in case I fall in battle. That doesn't mean I plan on dying, but I'm not in the shape I used to be. Alright old man, I'll bring Tsunade with me back to Konoha, even if she's the one dragging my lifeless body through the gates. I hope Naruto talks to me when I come back. The Sanin finished. Jiraiya left the building through the windowsill, leaving Hiruzen all alone. The Hokage stared at a picture of the Yondame. I'll correct my mistakes, Minato, even if it costs me my life. He glanced at his eternal enemy on his desk. Although I wished you had told me how to defeat paperwork before you died. 
Hiruzen groaned as he went back to stamping papers into the night. The next day, Naruto was jogging around the town in the early morning hours. He was thinking about the conversation he had with the Hokage and Jiraiya. The Sandame had finally told him why he was hated by the villagers. The boy felt like a burden was removed from his shoulders, even though it was now in his stomach. Although he was mad at Jiraiya, he needed to be civilized, or at least let his godfather explain his reasons the next time he saw him. Naruto was out of breath by the time he came back to his apartment. Not exercising for two weeks really drained his stamina. He had only completed one lap around Kanoha before retiring. He remembered the tent and said her father told him to come to the store today. Deciding to tell his friends about the Kaiubi later, Naruto showered and headed towards Higurashi weapons. Even though people were only beginning to wake up to start their day, the store was already open. Good morning, Kijiyu-san. Naruto waved to the older man. Good morning to you Naruto-kun. Tenten's father greeted in return. Why are you up this early? Even Tenten and Tara are still in bed. Kijiyu asked the now 10-year-old. I was out training when I remembered that Tenten told me to come see you today. Naruto explained. Well give me a minute and I'll go get you gift. The blacksmith responded. As Kijiyu went to the back to retrieve Naruto's gift, a sickly man walked into the store. The man's brown hair was covered by a blue bandana where his aid was located. He was wearing blue standard shinobi clothes along with a green flak jacket. The thing that caught Naruto's eye was the dark bags under the man's eyes. Excuse me cough is Kajiya san cough here? The sick man asked Naruto. Yeah he's in the back, are you okay? The blonde boy asked, as the person coughed again. Do you need someone to take you to the hospital? Naruto was honestly worried, as the man who looked like he was going to collapse any second. No, I'm fine, thank you. I had a cough problem because I breathed in some toxic gas on a mission. Since it was never fully cured, I was left with a cough problem. The shinobi explained. Kijiya came back with the wakizashi, and saw the man. Good morning Heid san what can I do for you today? The bold blacksmith asked. The man now known as Heid replied. Good morning Kijiya san Cough I was wondering if you can fix my katana for me. I chipped it during my last mission. Heid requested. Kijiya nodded while Naruto looked at Heid. Excuse me, do you practice kinjutsu? Naruto asked with hope in his words. Heid saw that he was being addressed, and nodded. I'm one of the kinjutsu masters in Kanoha, cough if I say so myself. Naruto smiled at finding a potential teacher. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Uzumaki Naruto, and I'm actually looking for a kinjutsu teacher. The boy introduced himself. Heid smiled, as well. My name is Jeko Heid, and it's nice to see that someone young cough I am interested in kinjutsu. I would be interested in teaching you, but you don't seem to have a blade. The kinjutsu user replied. Kijiya interrupted the two. Actually he does have one, this one right here. Kijiya said, as he held up a black wakizashi. This wakizashi is your Naruto-kun. This blade once belonged to Mikoto-san, and she wished for me to give it to you on your birthday. I hope you accept it. He gave the blade to Naruto. There was a maze, as the sheath was a pure black that seemed to absorb any light that touched it. The handle was black with a small orange Uzumaki swirl on it. There was an odd circle on top of the handle. I see you've noticed the circle. Go ahead and pull on it. Kiji commented. Naruto did, as told, and pulled the circle. When he pulled on it, a small kunai came out of the handle. That's one of the improvements I've made towards the blade. If you're in a pinch, the kunai should be able to at least surprise your enemies. Naruto returned the kunai to his place, and pulled the blade from its sheath. The wakizashi was a medium-length katana. The metal was a pristine white like it was brand new, and the blade itself was light. Naruto took a few swings with his new blade. The movements were fluid, and effortless like the blade was made for him. I see you like it. Mikoto-sen asked that I make her katana into a wakizashi for you because it suited you more. Kijiya smiled at the little blonde. She also told me to hand this to you, in case she didn't personally give you the wakizashi. The blacksmith handed the boy a scroll. The blonde boy placed the blade on the counter, as he received the scroll. When he tried to open it, the scroll resisted the force. I cough I believe you need to pump chakra in it to open it. Hei advised when he saw that Naruto was having trouble. The boy did, as told, and pumped chakra into it. As Heid explained, the scroll opened. Dear Naruto, if you've received this scroll then that means I'm gone from this world. My death must have come unexpectedly to you. You must have plenty of questions that you want answers to. I'll do my best, as your sensei, to provide you with those answers. The question you're most likely wondering is why I left a scroll with Kijiya-san in advance. The reason for this is because I knew that I didn't have long to live. For reasons I won't disclose, my death would help maintain peace in Kanoha. You might not understand, but you'll need to accept it. But even though I know I'll die, I'm filled with regret. You once asked me why I was so kind to you. The answer I gave you was a half lie. Well it was true I was kind to you out of my own free will, the real reason was because I was best friends with your mother. The Hokage has requested that I don't reveal her identity because of certain reasons, but that won't stop me from describing her to you. She was the most hard-headed and quick-tempered person I've ever known. 
But at the same time, she was also the most loving and friendliest person I've ever met. Her death, along with your father's, impacted me greatly. I fell into depression, knowing that a person I loved was gone from the world. I excluded myself from the world outside of Ichiha compound. My world brightened it up when a certain someone decided to graffiti the compound. I watched you rigorously clean up, and I couldn't help but think that you deserve a reward for your efforts. That was our first meeting, and that was when I noticed that you were my best friend's son. I offered to train you in order to atone for all the years I've forsaken you. I expected that we would bond over time. What I didn't expect was to see how you were treated by the village. It was as if everyone blamed you for everything that went wrong in their lives. Yet you still turned out to be the sweetest and most forgiving person in the world. I was in awe at how you continued to go on smiling even with all the obstacles placed in your life. The time we spent together was some of the happiest in my life. You brought joy back into my life. Still the thing that I'll regret the most is that I'll leave my sons without a mother. Itachi won't show it outwardly, but I know he's one of the most caring people in the world. He'll regret every day of his life for not finding a way to prevent my death. Sasuke will be left alone in the world, forced to fend for himself. My baby boy will seclude himself from the world, resenting his own weakness. And my last son will think that the world was set against him, when that's the farthest from the truth. He has people that care about him, and love him almost, as much, as I do. Even with my death, they'll help him regain his smile. Even as he reads this scroll, he knows that he isn't alone. That's why Naruto, my son, I want you to continue to smile. I want you to know that I love you with all of my heart. My tears refuse to dry, as I write this. I wish I could spend more days with my boys. I wish that I had entered your life earlier. I wish I was still alive to watch my three boys grow up to be fine young men. Wishes that I know that won't come true. Still I'm not worried because I know that my sons will do just fine without me. On the off chance that I'm wrong, Naruto, I want you to be there for Itachi and Sasuke. Out of the three of them, you're the strongest one. You'll be able to move on from this and become stronger. Well it's selfish of me to place the responsibility on your shoulders, I believe you can do it. The Wakizashi I've gifted you is your birthday present. It was originally my katana, but I believe that a Wakizashi would be a better fit for you. Use the Wakizashi to accomplish all your dreams. It saddens me that this will be my last present to you. Naruto, please stay strong. Know that I will always love you, and that I couldn't ask for a better son. Your loving mother, Ichiha Mikoto. As Naruto finished reading the note, he failed to notice the tears were running down his cheeks. The streams of liquid refused to stop, and they began falling onto the scroll. Not wanting to damage the scroll, the boy quickly wiped away his tears. He rolled up the scroll, and looked up. Naruto noticed that Heid and Kaji were looking away from him, most likely to give him some privacy. Grabbing the blade that Mikoto once used, a sad smile graced his face. Even after death, you still watch out for me. I'll treasure this Wakizashi, and use it to fulfill my dreams. And I promise that I'll be there for Itachi and Sasuke. Naruto thought, as his resolve strengthened. What are you going to name your blade? Heid asked, as he turned towards the blonde. Naruto looked to Kijiya. Did this blade have a name? The boy asked. Kijiya scratched his beard and pondered. I don't believe Mikoto-san gave it a name. Either that or she never told me his name. You should name it. The blacksmith suggested. Naruto looked at the blade and instantly found a worthy name. This Wakazashi will now be called Jogi no Kotoba, words of a ruler, too in honor of Mikoto-san. The boy said. Both males smiled at the name. I think that's an excellent name, Naruto. Kijiya commented. Well it looks like you have a blade now Naruto. A lady with long purple hair commented as she came into the store. The woman was wearing a dark green variety of shinobi clothes. On her arms were black sleeves that reached up near her shoulder. She had white wraps on her left leg, as well as her feet. Like Haid, she also had a green flak jacket. Yuga chan cough sorry it took so long, I was in here talking. Haid apologized to the woman. To Naruto, she seemed oddly familiar like he had seen her before. Looking at her long purple hair, he instantly recognized her. Katsan, is it you? Naruto asked, remembering the cat Anbu that helped him when he was little. Yuga smiled and nodded her head. Naruto that's my name when I'm in my Anbu uniform, my name otherwise is Yuzuki Yugao. Yugao introduced herself to Naruto. Naruto nodded before turning to Heid. Heid-san, can you teach me Kenjutsu? The blonde asked politely. Heid thought for a moment as he handed his katana to Kajiya. Sure, but only if you pass my test. Takubetsu Jonin replied. You'll spar with Yugao-chan while showing me your skills. You don't need to win, just show me cough that I won't regret training you. Yugao put a hand on her hip like she was annoyed. Don't I have a say in this? The Anbu woman wondered. Hey, promised that he'll make it up to her, and she agreed that it'll be a date. The sickly man told Naruto to meet him, and Yugao at training ground 12. The boy nodded, and headed home to prepare his supplies, as well as leaving the scroll from Makoto in a safe place. Naruto strapped his wakizashi to his waist, and headed to training ground 12. It was easy to find due to the fact that it was next to training ground 11. 
Unlike Training Ground 11, however, the landscape for Training Ground 12 was slightly different. The only real difference was that 12 stretched into a forest area full of trees. As he arrived, the blonde saw Yugao and Hei waiting. The Anbu woman had a katana strapped to her back. Since this is only a spar, there will be no kill shots, so try not to kill each other. The spar ends when I say so or when your opponent gives up. Hei explained the rules of the spar. Yugao turned to him with a grin on her face. You could be a proctor for the exam someday. The purple-haired woman commented. Hei didn't respond as he raised his hand. Yugao and Naruto got into their battle stances. Hei swung his hand down to start the match. Bijito vs Naruto. Naruto quickly fled into the woods as soon as the match started. Damn it, I was hoping that he wouldn't flee into the woods. As an Anbu, Yugao was often tasked with watching over Naruto. After the incident where the blonde pranked the Anbu HQ, she was also tasked with capturing him. Like everyone else, she was unable to spot Naruto anywhere in the village after the prank was committed. She had hoped he would fight her head on. Now she either had to chase after him while running through possible traps or wait until he showed himself. She decided on option third. Make him come out. Kaden. Hausenka no Jutsu, Mythical Fire Phoenix Technique. Yugao shot small fireballs from her mouth and aimed it at the trees. Some trees were burned from the technique, but Naruto still didn't appear. The kunai was thrown from the trees, and Yugao easily sidestepped it. This time, two shurikens came whirling from her left, making Yugao run forward. Despite this action, the shurikens followed her movements. What? How is it following me? The woman mused when she saw an odd glimmer from the sun. He's using ninja wire to control the shuriken's path. Yugao grabbed her katana and severed the connection. From his hiding spot, Naruto waited for the right opportunity to strike. When Yugao turned her back on Naruto, he pounced. The Anbu woman felt a presence behind her, so she drove her left foot into the ground and spun with her right foot in the air. Her foot met a burned piece of wood, and the wood shattered under the pressure. He was able to co just in time, but how did he get behind me? Her thoughts were interrupted when two shuriken attached with ninja wire came from her right and left. She ran forward only for a kunai to come straight at her face. She tilted her body to the side to avoid the flying projectile. Only her instinct saved her from the next attack. Naruto side swiped with his blade, forcing Yugao to drop to the ground. The blonde swung his blade down, but was interfered by Yugao's katana. Yugao, using her superior strength, pushed Naruto's wakizashi back. She pressed her hands on the ground and swung her feet up to her chest. As soon as her knees were over her head, her hands pushed off the ground allowing her body to sail towards Naruto. The boy crossed his arms across his chest when Yugao's kick landed on his arms. Naruto skidded back from the force of the kicks. He had no time to think, as Yugao was already up and pressing him. The purple-haired woman swung her katana in a downward arc, and Naruto blocked by raising his wakizashi with his right hand. He instantly grabbed the handle with his left hand and pulled out the small kunai. He flicked the kunai at Yugao's chest, forcing her to dodge by bending backwards. He used Kawarimi to switch places with the kunai and swung his blade upwards towards Yugao's back. With cat-like reflexes, Yugao used her blade to hit the top of Naruto's sword. She flipped her body upright instantly and swung her sword's handle at Naruto's right hand. The move caused Naruto's hand to tense up and he dropped his blade. The next thing he felt was Yugao's katana pressed against his neck. I give up. Naruto said while raising his hand upwards. Clapping could be heard from hate. I must say, you're better than I thought. The Kenjutsu user praised it. Yugao put a katana back into his sheath, and Naruto did the same. You almost got me Naruto. That's something even if I'm only going at you with 25% of my full strength. Naruto's jaw dropped at the reveal. Man, I thought you were going full strength the whole time. The boy commented, sad that she wasn't going all out. Hey, and Yugao laughed at his disappointment. Naruto, if I was going full strength, you wouldn't have made it to the woods. I'm not an Anbu for nothing. The purple-haired woman explained, trying to bring up his spirits. Naruto I must say that performance was cough impressive. Cough I would gladly train you in Kenjutsu, but I'll admit that you have some weaknesses. Although Yugao is older than you, she was able to outmuscle and outrun you when she wasn't going full speed. I know that it sounds harsh since she's an Anbu, but I think we should work on allowing you to go faster at bursts and strength training. Your stamina is good, as you don't cough seem fatigue. You're able to make some good plans, but it seemed like you were swinging your sword wildly at times. I figured that you don't have a style so I'll cough help you find one. Now I want you to explain the battle to me, and why you did such things so I can help choose a Kenjutsu style that fits you. Hey to praise Naruto's performance. I usually train at the training grounds next to this one, so I'm used to the terrain around here. As you said, I don't have a Kenjutsu style, so I plan to attack with long distance attacks. I ran into the woods, hoping Yugao-san would follow me. She didn't, and tried to flush me out. I threw a kunai to get her to dodge. I then threw two shurikens that I attached with ninja wire, and directed her back to her original position. As soon as she saw the wire, I tied the wire to a tree branch. 
I then used Kawarimi with the kunai I threw earlier, and used Henge to change into a kunai, as fast as possible. When she cut the wire, I waited until her back was turned to attack her, but she spun around, and kicked me. Luckily I was able to use Kawarimi with a bird log. I once again pulled out my ninja wire, and shurikens, except this time I attached the wire to a tree trunk. I let them loose, and they traveled in a circular fashion towards Yugao-san. I threw a kunai, forcing her to dodge. Once again I used Kawarimi to get behind her, but she dropped to the ground. I resumed my attack, but she did this awesome maneuver where she flipped her body up, and kicked me. She pressed her attack, which I blocked before pulling out my secret kunai. I threw it at her, and she did the crazy matrix thing, and dodged. I used Kawarimi once more, and aimed for her unprotected back, but she used her cat reflexes to dodge. Which I can totally see why you're called cat now. Yugao-san hit my hand, and made me drop my wakizashi. That ended the spar. Naruto finished speaking, as he ran out of breath. Hey, Aid, and Yugao stood there accessing what they just heard. No academy student should be able to remember every part of the battle, and analyze it, well, except for maybe Inar. They were very impressed with Naruto's intellect both inside and outside of battle. Yugao can see that all those pranks he committed were essentially traps that were harmless. The way he hid and executed his traps were similar to how Nanbu was taught. Hey, then spoke to Naruto. I might have a style for you, but I'll have to look it up to be sure. Let's say we meet here once a week for training on Mondays. The male Kenjutsu user proposed. Naruto nodded, and went to retrieve his supplies that he used during the spar. Yugao then spoke out loud. You've really found a diamond in the rough. He's quite impressive for one so young, but he seems over-reliant on the Kawarimi no Jutsu. Hei shook his head. There's a reason why Yugao-chan. After all he was trained by Kof Kawarimi no Megami. He told her. Yugao was shocked by what Hei revealed. The last person Makoto held train was the prodigy Shisei. She then saw why Naruto used that technique so much. He was probably honoring her in his own way. Later that afternoon, after freshening up, Naruto headed to the Aburam compound. He arrived at Shino's place, and called for the Aburam air. Once Shino arrived, the blonde boy told Shino that he needed to tell him, and Shikamaru something important. Shino's eyebrow quivered, but he agreed to come with him. The duo walked to the Nara compound in silence. They arrived to see Shikamaru and Shikaku playing shogi. They all exchanged greetings with one another. Shikamaru I need to talk with you about something important, and preferably in private. Naruto said while rubbing the back of his head. Both Shikaku's and Shikamaru's eyebrows rose just like Shino's did earlier. Does he know about his tenant? Maybe the Hokage told him. Anyway it's too troublesome to get involved. Shikaku thought, missing that Shikamaru said they were going to borrow the privacy room. When the boys were all in the room, Shikamaru activated the privacy seals. So what do you want to talk about? Nara asked his blonde friend. Well you know how in the books, it says the Kayubi was killed by Yondane. The truth is that the Kayubi can't be killed since it's made purely out of chakra. The only way to stop the Kayubi is by sealing it in a newborn baby. The baby will then become a human container of the beast. Yandame was able to seal Kayubi into a baby at the expense of his own life. Naruto finished, as he gulped down his nervousness. He needed to tell them the next part. So that baby was you, right? The lazy Nara guessed. Naruto spun towards Shikamaru, and stared wide-eyed. Judging from your reaction, how the villagers look at you, the graffiti on the walls of your apartment, and how all the adults seem to know something we don't mean I'm right. I didn't know the exact reason why, but I would have known eventually. Shikamaru shared his logic with the group. Naruto chuckled nervously. As expected of you Shika, you really are too smart for your own good sometimes. They commented. I, as well, suspected something was going on. Naruto looked to the source of the voice, Shino. My friend told me that you seem to have two different chakras. I now know the reason why. Aburam clarified. Naruto sat there in disbelief, his own friends already sort of knew something about him was different. If what you said is true, then you're just the prison keeping the prisoner within you. Is the seal secured? Shikamaru asked although he inwardly knew the answer. Yeah it's the most secure seal out of all of them. The Hokage and Jureya of the Sanin told me so. Naruto answered. Well if they say so, then we don't have anything to worry about. Shikamaru said while Shino nodded. You guys aren't scared of me. You don't believe that I'm the Kayubi in disguise? The blonde inquired. Naruto trusted his friends, but he needed reassurance. Look Naruto, you're a very good friend of ours. You're one of the kindest people I know because you always give people a second chance even when they don't deserve it. If you're actually the Kayubi in disguise, then you're one friendly demon. Shikamaru smirked. As I said once before, you don't discriminate against my clan. You openly listen to us talk about insects while also engaging in the conversation, as well. You're an ally to us, and will always be until you say so. Shino chimed in. Naruto grabbed both of them, and gave them a big hug. I knew I could trust you guys, thank you so much for accepting me. Oh, and you can't tell anyone about this because it's an S-class secret. Naruto added with a huge smile. Shikamaru just muttered troublesome while Shino answered with silence. Naruto, Shino wait here for a second. 
I also got something I want to show you. Shikamaru said after he pried himself from Naruto. He then left the room, only to come back with a book, and handed it to the blonde. Shikamaru then motioned Shino to sit next to Naruto while he sat on the other side. When I said I didn't have a present for you, I was only telling you a half-truth. I didn't have your present because it wasn't ready yet. Shikamaru explained. Naruto then opened the book Shikamaru gave him. Inside was a picture of Shikaku, Yoshino, the Yandame, and a red-haired woman. Shikaku was standing next to Yoshino while Yandame stood next to the red-haired woman. The picture had writing that said from the Red Hot Habanero. I accidentally saw this picture in one of my family's old photo albums when I was forced against my will to help clean a few weeks ago. It was tucked in the back so you wouldn't see it if you didn't look carefully. I was curious so I asked my parents about it. They simply took the picture from me and told me not to worry about it. That only further intrigued me so I went to the library and I found out her name. Her name was Uzumaki Kashina and I believe that she's your mother. Before Naruto could comment, Shikamaru continued. That wasn't even the most surprising thing. It said that her son was presumed dead along with her. If you look at the picture, your mom and Yandame seem close. That's because they actually are close. Uzumaki Kashina's husband was Namika's Minato, in other words, Yandame was your father. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic. Link is in the description. See you next time, till then sayonara.